Yes, it is. Welcome back, Tactical Mother Flowers, to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today, we've got David from Travel Tradecraft on with us. And David's Instagram is at Travel Tradecraft. His website is traveltradecraft.com. And Dave uh, has acquired this knowledge that he shares on Instagram and on the blogs, free blogs on his website. I have to clarify that, that they're free. You don't have to pay for his blog. So go and check out the website if you like travel, safety, security, trade craft, things like that. He's acquired this knowledge over many years of traveling. Starting as a young kid, uh, he spent time in the fire academy and then EMT school, becoming a volunteer fire fighter slash EMT in rural Colorado. This evolved into an ever-changing wild ride that has taken him to many places ever since. In addition to posts on travel safety, privacy, as well as fitness, nutrition, uh, he's also got product reviews on the website. And uh, this type of destination really attracts a certain type of personality. I think if you're listening to this podcast right now, you really are one of those personalities that's always learning and always wanting to learn more about your warriorship and your warrior craft skills and abilities. So Dave, welcome on to the podcast. Thanks for coming on, dude. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. It's uh, It really is a pleasure to have you on. We've been going back and forth for about a year now, and uh, we finally made it work. So you, sir, have kind of a hidden persona. I know you don't put any pictures of yourself up on the Instagram or the website. Uh, and a lot of what you post, in fact, almost everything you post is straight information. There's not really too much background about yourself there. So before we dive in with the questions, I kind of want to ask you, is there anything that you can expand upon for us as far as your background and what got you into travel safety and security? And how did you start learning about all of this and take it away? Sure. So I uh, traveled a lot as a kid and as good parents do, they kind of kept me oblivious to some of the dangers and stuff and just tried to make it, you know, a good time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as it grew up, we had a couple incidents, nothing super major, but not the, uh, I guess, rainbow dreamy travel world that the parents tried to make it seem. Mm -hmm. So that got me a little bit interested in it. Learned some of the basics. And then as a kid, you know, just trying to play soldier and spy and stuff like that then went through high school got out of high school went to join the military and i had a tattoo that kept me out mm. and so i went to emt school while i was getting it removed did some wildland fire for a little bit and then went back and ended up being medically disqualified mm. so then i went on to police academy and then uh, did that for a little, or got out of that, did law enforcement for a little bit, and then got out back in, uh, let's see, what was that, 2017, prior to all the real craziness of the last few years, and then uh, just kind of started doing my own thing, dove into research and took a couple of classes, and that's about it. And then it's just kind of grown from there. Well, listen, you are lucky that you're out of law enforcement at this point. It's, uh, it's been kind of a crazy couple of years. And uh, talk about having a target on your back. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. And then when we were at the when I was in the academy, it wasn't the craziness we're dealing with now, but we were having or at least we were told we were having threats from ISIS type groups. Hmm. So like our entire academy weren't allowed to go anywhere without at least two other people with us. And hmm. So different target, but we had targets all the way back then. So, Well, I mean, cops have always been targets and they'll continue to be targets for terrorist groups, whether that's domestic terrorist groups or foreign terrorist groups. It's, you know, all the same in my book. And, um, for the life of me, I, I don't think I can fully understand why, you know, these people want to want to hurt cops. I mean, look, I get it. There's been, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of problems and stuff like that. But, you know, you can't 
you can't go around and and judge someone just by the uniform. You know, it's 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 uncalled for and it's simply inappropriate. Absolutely. When we talk about travel safety, who's going to use this type of stuff? I mean, a lot of guys and girls out there, and you know, look, we we sell travel safety products on our website, um, and it frankly, it's not a big seller because. A lot of guys and girls out there saying, you know, well, I'm going to go to Europe. Why do I need this travel safety crap for? Why do I need to know about, you know, how to blend into an environment or how to keep my electronics secure? I'm not going anywhere that's going to need me to, you know, wear ambiguous colors or do quick change disguises. Who is this travel safety trade craft really geared to? Well, I guess pretty much the people that have woken up to it already are really the ones that are going to seek it out anyway and how to, like you said before, seek the knowledge and try to better themselves. And But I have noticed in the last few years, especially these last few since it's gotten crazy before the pandemic started, that there has been an uptick in it because some of the stuff that's happening down in Mexico started making a little bit more headline news at least for a while there some major incidents in places like greece yeah. very prominent um i feel bad now i forgot her name but there was a really prominent professor who was there for a convention and went just out for a run and then they didn't find her for like two or three weeks later and she was uh i think it was like an it was an old world war ii bunker or something they found her body in yeah, that, so, that stuff happens a lot in, in Greece. There had been a big problem before uh, with organized crime, and then you had the economic turmoil. And um, unfortunately, the economic turmoil has really spread through the whole world. Um, so what I want to ask you, Dave, right now is, since COVID has happened, um, the world has become completely unsafe. And I think nations like Greece, who are unsafe before they uh they're gonna stay unsafe and get worse places like south america places parts of africa the middle east will continue to deteriorate um and i suppose that somebody traveling over to that area whether it be you know eventually again for business or somebody crazy like me who likes to travel for adventure you know it would be a really good idea for us to brush up on these security aspects of you know, trade craft and whatnot. Absolutely. And then on top of that, some of the most beautiful areas and awesome places to go see are in some of the sketchier places. Mm -hmm. So like um, rural Southeast Asia has some of the most beautiful temples and stuff. But then on the flip side, you have um, country, or parts of the countries that rival Afghanistan with the violence and the terrorist groups taking control. Hmm. So, especially if you, for the travelers that like to get off the beaten path and out of the tourist traps and stuff, learning to protect yourself and stay safe is definitely paramount. Now you bring up Asia, which is, I'm glad you did because this is a question that I get a lot and I've never really been able to fully answer it. How does a guy that looks like me, you know, white guy, 5'11", blonde hair, blue eyes, now how the hell do I blend in in a country like Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam? You don't, <laughs> and you embrace it. <laughs> right. You, uh, I mean, it's not so much blending in based on your looks, which can be part of it so obviously someone of asian descent traveling there will blend in a lot better but a big step to just not seeming like a tourist is trying to learn the language even if it's a little bit because just that simple little trick will make them more or anywhere you go more warm to you mm -hmm. they will see that you're actually trying and try to earn give you a little bit more slack you're not the obnoxious american who's talking really loud looking for the mcdonald's mm. and pushing everybody out of the way and so 
Yeah, one thing I've learned about other Americans, and I'm guilty of this myself, is we talk really loud a lot compared to, you know, people in um, the Netherlands or even Germany per se, uh, European countries, even Asian countries, they talk very quietly, even on the streets in the city, they are not loud like we are all the time. So, you know, that's one thing that you have to be kind of self, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, man? self Self-aware. Self-aware, correct. Um, and that's, I think, a big part of it too, if I'm correct. Absolutely. And it's not just volume, but the, along with language is doing the research and finding any of the other little idiosyncrasies. So like some countries, eye contact is offensive, whereas some it's respectful. Some countries shake hands, some don't. There's the distance you stand. So like some countries, they're almost touching face to face and some they want arm's length. Mm. And it's just knowing that stuff beforehand. And so that you show that you've looked into it and you have that respect for their culture. And that will go miles for not so much blending in, but not necessarily standing out. Yeah, I think advanced research is a really big, big deal when it comes to travel trade craft. Now, is there any specific resources that you could give us to know and start getting to know about these cultural nuances before we go? Would we just type it into YouTube with the uh, area of operation that we're going to be deploying to? Or would we, you know, is there other websites possibly that can help us get a better grasp on the exact culture that we're going to? So it, there's a few different things you can do. So I like to start first with checking any security threats. And so there's a few different um, websites that stuff that you can, they're usually all paid services, but you can sign up and then uh, dictate a specific area that you're going to, whether it's Asia or even sometimes down to a specific country. And they can give you a short little dossier of just about anything major that you need to watch out for there. That's where I usually start. Hmm. Then to go on to the cultural stuff, um, I found that travel guides from like actual in physical bookstore travel guides usually have a pretty good place to start. And then you can find places to search more of online from there. Oh, that's a really good idea, actually. I never really thought about that old school book travel guides. Yeah, and they're also great to take with you for uh, finding hotels, especially mm. if you get there and find out your phone doesn't work. Or, mm. um, but I do highly recommend never pulling it out when you're walking down the street because that is kind of a dead giveaway. Two things jumped out at me right here, and I want to start with the latter, is that you probably don't want to appear as a tourist. Why? Would that be just making yourself kind of a target, like we were talking about earlier with, you know, before when you were wearing the police uniform, you had a target on your back. Is it the same way overseas when somebody knows that you're a tourist? Absolutely. And the severity of the risk depends on the country you're going to, obviously, but it's just, it's human nature. Cultural groups tend to stick to their own and they will target outsiders before they target their own. Mm. so especially the criminals if they see an outsider or in this case a tourist they're going to operate under the assumption that they don't know anything about where they're at they don't know the scams they don't know what the customs are they don't know what's acceptable and what's not and they're going to try to use that to their advantage to in either the lower end scam you or on the higher end kidnap you murder you depending on what that criminal is looking for. And I suppose knowing what the criminal intent there might be before you go would be a big advantage, whether maybe there's some groups friendly to ISIS over there and they don't like Americans or, you know, simply like I think at a lot of places in India, for example, where they're just going to try to scam you out of all of your money. Uh, would probably be a very valuable thing. Again, like you were saying, to jump on the internet, visit one of those sites and do that research before you go. Absolutely. 
and in certain countries certain scams are more prevalent like in the u.s you don't really hear about pickpockets anymore right but they are still very big in europe Mm -hmm. so when we talk about pickpockets and i have a question about hotels but we'll circle back around to that pickpockets in europe man how do we kind of counter that so when it comes to countering any threat, I've found the best way to counter it is to learn to do it. Hmm. You learn how they do it, and then you can figure out ways to get around it. But the easiest way, so for we'll start with men. For men is minimize your wallet as much as possible. Hmm. So like minimalist wallets are becoming very popular, which is a good thing. But simply taking that wallet, moving it from your back pocket to your front pocket increases the difficulty severely for someone trying to pickpocket because the front pockets are a little bit tighter they have to come at you from the front really to get access to it yeah that's a good idea um you know i grew up in new york city and that was something we learned at an early age back when pickpockets were still around is that you don't ever carry your wallet in the back pocket if you're going to carry it carry it in the front pocket always more secure that way. Um, Now to circle back around to my question, which is, this is on everybody's mind when they're picking a hotel. Okay, what's the trade-off between a nice hotel, you know, something three, four, even maybe even five stars if you've got that money. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got hostels and, you know, cheaper hotels where you can bed down if you're backpacking or something like that. Is there a trade-off between these nicer places and the cheaper places as far as security, um, let's just say operational security goes? Honestly, probably not as much as you'd think, at least that's guaranteed. Hmm. So part of the problem is a lot of hotels and establishments now everywhere have found that it is very easy to fake star ratings on review sites. Hmm. So that is one place to start, but it definitely should not be your end all of the research. Hmm. Now you can go to actual hotel reviewers. I, I, the names are escaping me at the moment, but there's a few of them out there that have been reviewing hotels and establishments forever. Hmm. That's a better, better place to go get more information but you still have the threat so as far as hotels go you have the threat of it's not it's not threat but you have to think can you 100 percent trust everyone that's going to be in your room and nowadays especially since the las vegas shooting most hotels do not allow the whole nobody in your room do not disturb signs anymore hmm. Whether you put that up or not, you're going to have somebody from the hotel in your room at least once a day. Hmm. And if I remember right, like Disney World, I'm pretty sure it's two or three times a day. Wow. Whereas, so you have that potential threat, but you are more insulated from outside threats, Hmm. especially if you're on a higher floor when they can't get in through a window or something. They have to go through that hotel and then higher end hotels tend to have some form of security. So there is that. Now the benefits of the hostel side or some of those lower end ones is like hostels, you're obviously sharing rooms. They're almost there a lot of times they're bunk rooms. So you have to, you have more threat from outsiders, but they're much cheaper. And so you can also travel a lot longer and more um, affordably. Mm -hmm. but the way I travel and the way I recommend traveling kind of negates all those threats. So you can travel in whatever lifestyle or luxury level you really want. Cause I don't recommend. So part of the way, like not standing out is packing light so you can carry it with you. Mm -hmm. And so when you're backpacking, it's obviously you're carrying everything you want. So you want to pack light anyway. But it just makes moving around everything else, or moving around much more easy. It's much simpler. And in some countries, if you show up with a big roller bag, 
you're not going to be able to get on any form of public transportation because they can't handle the size of them. Yeah. So I always, so I like, and I recommend traveling if, if at all possible, one bag carry on. So like I went to Alaska for my honeymoon in the middle of winter <laughs> and you can get it done with a carry on bag, even with needing all the extra clothing and, yeah, it's, it's possible. It definitely is possible. Um, you know, it depends and it depends who you're traveling with as well. I think, you know, uh, if you're traveling with a girl, it's, it's more difficult to get them to bring one carry on bag. You know, they're probably going to have a whole bag for their shoes, depending on what kind of girl it is. Right. But absolutely. It, <laughs> it's, um, it's definitely possible. Another thing that guys talk about as well, you know, well, I want to bring a, I want to bring a folding knife, tactical folder with me or, or this or that, which is a whole nother area that we can discuss, but you know, you might not be able to bring that tactical folder with you if you're going ahead and um, carrying that bag on the flight. But I'm sure there are other, are other ways of defending yourself, whether that's, hey, you buy the damn thing when you get off, you get a cheap one that you can throw away or you know, maybe get a pen, learn how to use something like that. How much self-defense, physical self-defense, should somebody be learning about and taking kind of before they start really traveling the world? Well, I would say even before, not necessarily before traveling, but just in general, learning to defend yourself, especially without weapons, is probably, especially nowadays, getting more and more paramount. Yeah. So you want to be at least I would say taking a course regularly with someone because a lot of class, a lot of schools and instructors and stuff you'll see they'll do like a three-hour course on a weekend and say it's how to defend yourself and that really doesn't do much except it really should only be getting people to realize that they need to take a class but yeah. the problem is a lot of people will go there and then think they can defend themselves when in reality it's the repetitive training and everything that really gets it to where you can defend yourself well said so i would say whether you're traveling or not being enrolled in some form <laughs> of martial arts is probably a pretty good bet right now how about survival training I mean, I'm not necessarily talking about going in the woods and, you know, living off a survival kit, but something along those lines to be able to prevail through a bad situation or survive, whether that's a counter custody class or whether that's just, you know, uh, situational awareness, evasive driving even. Is that something that you would recommend to uh, travelers before they start really getting out there? So some of those, yes, some of them, no, but it would really depend on where they're going. But so like they're going South America, absolutely counter cust any as much counter custody stuff that you can get to. Mm -hmm. I would definitely recommend. Um, I'm sure you've heard of him, but Ed Calderon's mm -hmm. puts on a great school and classes that I would love to take if I ever get the chance. But there are other ones out there as well. I'll be taking Ed's counter custody course in Vegas coming up here uh, in September, I believe. And then another one, I believe in October. So if anyone out there can join me for that, his courses book up like that. And I just snapped my fingers in case you guys couldn't hear that. Uh, they really do. They literally, he comes out with a course and a month later, they're all, the seats are all gone. But uh, oh, yeah. a, a quick plug for, for Ed out there. He doesn't need that, obviously. But any of you guys who can join me, I'd love to have you. I'd love to see you out there. Um, counter custody is such an important thing. Like you said, I think for, you know, certain Middle Eastern nations, South America, you bring up South America and I'm glad you did because, uh, actually I was going to travel to, uh, Costa Rica this summer and, uh, Costa Rica has always been a very safe nation in, in South America, but I got a couple of buddies that live out there and they actually called me up. They said, well, you know, not only is the COVID situation getting really bad out here, but, we're starting to see armed robberies take place. And that's something that you haven't really seen too much from what I understand out there. So it really enhances your point that things are getting dicey everywhere in the world right now. 
Absolutely. I have a, a couple of clients that used to go down there for business pretty regularly. She worked with a, uh, he was an expat that lives down there. And when she was going down there, it, like you said, generally it was seemed or deemed very safe. She still hadn't. So speaking of hotel security, she had an incident where the hotel security guard tried to force himself into her room. Wow. So that's where you can't always trust the hotel staff. But, in, yeah. but like you said, they are get, it's getting dangerous everywhere. I still, from what I've seen and what I've been reading, Costa Rica is still probably on the much safer side compared to some other places mm -hmm. south. But it's, like you said, it's definitely getting worse everywhere. On the flip side, but, I've got... A, and then a, with that on Costa Rica, because like you were, because you brought up COVID, I'm not sure if it's still this way, but they had mandated that you have to buy gov or Costa Rican government health insurance yes. in order to travel there, but it also didn't really cover anything. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it's all about the money. Um, you know, this whole COVID situation really brings up a couple of good points here, I think. And number one is that People want to travel, right? People, when, as soon as you tell them you can't travel anywhere, you can't go anywhere, what do people do? They start fucking booking yep. air, air tickets. They start going. Exactly. Um, number two. Well, not only that, but because yeah. you tell everyone they can't travel, the prices drop. Exactly. So naturally, everyone's going to go jump on board. Exactly. Um, and number two, it brings up a, a, something that you talk about a lot on your website and on your blogs is staying healthy while you travel. I think that's so important now. It's always been important, but you know, you're, you're going, you're changing time zones, you're getting on planes, you're getting off planes, you're not getting a lot of sleep, you're on the move, you're not drinking your you know, green fruit smoothie and your protein shakes 10 times a day. How does one stay healthy when they're on the road like that? What's up, guys? So I'm going to ask you a quick question, and I want you to be as honest with yourself as possible. Do you have the skill sets to put down a violent attacker. If you were attacked out on the city streets tomorrow, do you have what it takes to put down that aggressor? What if they were 150 pounds heavier than you? What if they were on drugs? What if they were just a hardened street criminal? Could you fight them? Could you do enough damage to them to at least get away? Well, listen, I want you to be aware that gutterfightingsecrets.com, we've got the original Gutter Fighting Combatives DVD. That's going to teach you a lot of really necessary skill sets, and they're very simple to learn. They're very simple to implement, and that's why we did it that way, so that you can learn simple techniques to defend yourself and get away. It's not all about spending hours and hours and hours in the dojo or in the gym, perfecting your lift, perfecting your rear naked choke and your ankle locks and your Muay Thai kicks, it's a lot simpler than that. And I want to show you exactly how it's done on the original Gutter Fighting Secrets Combatives DVD. That's available at GutterFightingSecrets.com. In addition to that, we've also got great travel safety products, not only written by me, but we've also got stuff that I co-authored with DJ, who's a close protection, executive protection specialist, who's been doing this for, well, ever since he got out of the Army. He's an Iraq combat vet. He knows what he's talking about, and I want you to have this information because like we're talking about with Dave from Traveler's Tradecraft, this world is really becoming a dangerous place very rapidly, and if you're going to be traveling anywhere outside of the country or inside of the country, I need you to have the right mindset and the right information because there's a lot of false doctrine out there. We're going to be discussing this in the podcast so stand by for that. You're going to hear Dave himself tell you there's a lot of bullshit when it comes to the whole gray man theory and operational doctrine that's really not operational doctrine. It's bullshit. So I want you to have the real McCoy, the real stuff. I realize it's not all sexy, but it's what you need to know. So head over to GutterFightingSecrets.com. Take a look at the free blog. Take a look at the travel safety products. Travel safety, travel safety 2.0, which is all update information. And then you've obviously got the Travel Safety PDF and audiobook co-authored not only with me, but DJ, Close Protection Executive Protection Specialist, who works with, I'm just going to leave it at that. 
Anyway, guys, I look forward to seeing you over there. Make sure you subscribe to the site because you never know how long we're going to be on social media. And I want you to stay in touch and stay part of this network because you better believe if it ever became necessary, we'll push things out through gutterfightingsecrets.com. And I'm not simply talking about products. I think you get the gist of what I'm saying. I look forward to seeing you over there. I look forward to seeing you subscribe and become a member of the site and build the community with us there. All right, enough of my talking. Enough of this commercial. Let's get back to the Gutter Fighting Secrets podcast with Dave from Traveler's Tradecraft. All right, welcome back, guys. So, Dave, how do we stay stay healthy while we're on the road like that? So, it goes just about like how staying healthy anywhere else. Good baseline is good nutrition and good water and your normal everyday life. And the more you do that, the better you can withstand periods of unhealthiness or any bugs you might encounter. Mm. But the big ones for traveling are, have always been water and food. Especially when you're traveling in undeveloped countries. But we'll start with food because it applies everywhere. Every country and every culture is going to have different cuisines and different styles of food as i'm sure everybody knows and if you're not used to eating that it can severely jack up your system just the stress from traveling can jack up your system so what i recommend for food is if you can find a restaurant in your area that serves authentic versions of the food where you're going is to go eat there you know once a week or twice a week leading up to your trip so that your body gets used to that And then on the water side, I always travel with like either iodine tablets or a water filter in case I can't find bottled water while I'm there. But sticking to bottled water, especially in the more developed countries, can usually keep you from having any issues. That's a good idea. Um, Would you recommend in certain countries maybe brushing your teeth with bottled water and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. Anything you use water for where it's ingesting it or going inside you, especially in those lesser developed countries, I definitely recommend using bottled water. Like if you're traveling to Paris or Munich or any of the major cities like Europe or other developed parts of the world, it's probably not that big of an issue, but just about anywhere else, it's probably a better bet to stick to bottled water if you have the ability. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. And now as far as, you know, first aid and taking care of your stuff like that, vitamins, now you're, you're a former EMT, so this is right up your alley. What kind of stuff are we going to want to throw in our travel first aid kit? So before that, you'd want to, or back, going back to research, is look into where you're going and see if there's any mandatory shots or recommended medications. So like the big one that comes to mind is places that have malaria. If you're going somewhere, you can go to your doctor here and usually get a prescription for the anti-malaria drugs. And then you can take usually, uh, I'm not a doctor, so talk to them, but they usually you can take, they'll have you take them prophylactically to get it in your system before you get there. Mm. And then keep taking it while you're there to ward off any of those nastier bugs. So I'd start there. But then on the basic over-the-counter side, just about any good small little trauma slash first aid kit is good to take with you. So like the one I use, I or it uh, came from a place called ITS Tactical, which I'm sure you probably have heard of them. And I forget which one it call which one it's called because I think they changed their names, but it just comes in a little zipper bag. It's about the size of like a bank bag, and it fits perfectly in carry on, Mm -hmm. or even as small as a fanny pack. And so it'll have your basic trauma stuff, so like quick clot, pressure dressings. I've upgraded it to have um, I put a chest seal Mm -hmm. and a uh, chest dart in there but i those are very or the chest dart especially is something that takes very advanced training so don't take it with you if you don't know how to use it yeah 
but for the bare minimum absolute must have is a tourniquet because mm. you can get by with wrapping your finger in a t-shirt if you get cuts or stuff like that but if you get major trauma a tourniquet is going to save your life mm. yeah that's a that's a really good point about the tourniquet we've been really using those a lot since uh you know the iraq war happened and guys were saying before that oh don't tourniquet things and then we're finding out, oh, you can leave those damn things on for upwards of 12 hours before, you know, you really have to worry. And I'm not a doctor again, um, so don't quote me on that. Uh, Dave, you might know a little bit better than I do because you've probably be, been, you know, an EMT a little bit longer than I have, but you, uh, you certainly sound like you know what you're doing. As far as the chest art and stuff goes, now, is that something that we'd want to take classes on and I mean if we are going out to let's say we're going to somewhere in Africa where there's some nonsense going on or maybe even some parts of the Middle East like you said even in Asia there's more torn parts of the country we're going to that place and we want to take a basic bleeding control kit with us you know how much training should we get before we go ahead and, and buy something that we don't really know how to utilize half of the stuff so I would say the absolute bare minimum that anyone should take is a certification level is what it used to be called as first responder. I've been out of the, that realm for a little bit, so I don't know if it's still called that. It's basically a step above taking CPR and first aid. So it's going to go a little bit deeper into some trauma mitigation. It's going to cover some, um, some medications they're usually over the counter and it's very basic because there's a lot of liability on the school side if they tell you to use stuff. That would be the absolute bare minimum and just for anybody traveling anywhere. Now, like you said, if you're going to some place that's a little more sketchy, some places in South America, you're definitely going to want to get some more training, especially if they're austere. So if there's way less developed, like Africa, there's not a hospital within a hundred miles of where you're going to be. The, uh, the problem is a lot of those techniques are withheld to very certain certification schools. Mm -hmm. So like the chest art I was talking about is used in chest decompressions. When you collapse a lung, that training, the minimum level that you can officially get that training at is a paramedic level. And that's a two year course. I never made it to that level, but because I worked more rurally and because I was more heavily into wildland fire, so really rurally, some of our paramedics taught us some stuff to basically be able to save each other mm -hmm. if we needed to. But that being said, if you have those plans on the books and you're going someplace like that, you might be able to go to some places that teach the more tactical medicine and tell them your concerns and they might be willing to depending on who depending on the person they might be willing to show you some of that stuff so the two that i know are really good outfits are lone star medics down in texas i believe is what their is their name hmm. they do a really good tactical medicine course and I can't remember if Dark Angel medica Medicine is still doing classes or if they're just selling kits now. And I think they're out of Colorado. We'll have to put the links down below for at least Lone Star Medics because I'm a big proponent in everybody having the right training for the right job. I remember when I was going through contractor training, we were taught uh, needle decompressions. We were taught, you know, tourniqueting, all of that stuff, the Israeli bandage. But when I went through EMT, that was always really reinforced to us. Like you said, no, 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 no. You can't do a needle decompression. That's, leave that up to the medics. Well, that's fine if you've got medics, you know, close enough to you to come. But if you're in South America somewhere, there are no freaking medics, right? So you're your own medic. And I think that it would be really valuable for you to learn how to do that. But you got to kind of know, um, Dave, and I'm sure you would, you would reinforce this to people. Hey, is it a tension pneumo or is it a you know, open new, is it, there's a lot of different things that you don't want to just go and jab someone in the chest if you're not a hundred percent sure of, you know, what you're doing and why. So, um, just a absolutely disclaimer from, from both of us know your stuff guys. And, um, 
Now, speaking about knowing your stuff, Dave, you were talking about- That's why I say always go to someplace like Lone Star Medics or, and you don't have to go to them, but there's good, or there's good outfits all over the country and learning when to do what and making sure you know it and is the biggest component in it. And is just like with most things, Hollywood with videos of them shoving pins in people's throats has really kind of put that <laughs> in a downward spin. <laughs> Spoken like a true EMT, sir. It's um, it was oh, they always taught us about that too in EMT school. Is you know, you're not gonna freaking um, give anyone a trach, this and that. Like it, it's it's something that people see and then they think of wilderness medicine as as that type of deal, but. Uh, like you said, you know, if you don't have that two years of medic training and then on job experience, I'm not going to let you freaking cut my throat open. That's for gosh damn sure. Oh, yeah. Because um, most yeah. of those medicine courses, like I remember EMT school for us, out of the six months we were there because it was full time, three of them were anatomy. Yeah. And then the rest and then the rest was crammed into the other three months because the anatomy parts what's important. And I and I know uh, paramedic school is about the same thing i think it's like between eight to nine months of just anatomy Jeez, i couldn't do it i couldn't do medic it's too much it's it's like becoming a mini doctor is what it is absolutely it's just like uh military's combat medics they're basically doctors but they just don't hold the certification and in a lot of ways they operate better than doctors do because they're operating under stress Hmm. yeah you think about you know combat medic or a corpsman or whatever it is and uh i gotta give those guys nothing but respect because not only are they doing incredibly stressful stuff but they're getting shot at while they do it and <laughs> that's just crazy absolutely my uh one of my emt instructors was a uh I believe he, he was just a paramedic. I don't believe he was a PJ, but he was an Air Force medic in Iraq. And that was always his biggest component or biggest thing he tried to teach us was that if he can do it in 110 degree heat while he's getting shot at, we can do it and not freak out. We can do it here in the States and not freak out. Yeah. And that if we're freaking out, we're no help to anybody. Well, speaking about freaking out, man, and I'm glad you brought this up because this is a big thing is you can go ahead and practice, practice, practice in class and everything. But once you really come upon that first emergency or even the first couple of emergencies, your OPQRST and all that stuff is going to go right out the window because your adrenaline's flowing so much. Uh, is there anything that over the years of working, you know, not only on the EMT, but also firefighting, and then later on in your law enforcement career, is there anything that you could give us to kind of help us manage that stress and adrenaline when something finally does happen? The big, big part of its preparation, and I think the new fancy term they're calling it now is stress inoculation. Hmm. And it's basically, you start from ground zero and you walk your way up. So you start in class, you learn the skills, then you move on to scenario based training and you keep it nice and slow and then as you progress they st you start amping up the stress so like our school so like the school i went to we started in class we learned all the techniques and then on the weekends we did nothing but scenarios and they always started out easy nice and slow and then they started putting us on the clock mm. and just slowly gradually ramping up that stress level and the difficulty level and eventually you'll get to a level where it starts to become second nature and then once it's there, it doesn't matter so much how much stress you're in, as long as you can fall back to that muscle memory, and then your body's just going to take over. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing to help keep that calm is breathing. Mm -hmm. So when stuff starts going sideways, you have to be able to keep yourself or be enough self-aware to realize you're starting to get a little shaky and stop and take that nice couple of deep breaths and then go back to work. That's a good tip. That's a really good tip. Um, the breathing is so, is so key. I think that 
uh, you can back me up on this, man, is, you know, they teach us in the fire academy when we're going in, they teach us, um, some call it skip breathing, other just call it controlled breathing, but guys have a tendency to suck down their whole bottle the first 5, 10, 15 minutes they're in a fire because they're so amped up and they're also carrying heavy shit. But if you can kind of control your breathing a little bit, it's funny because not only can you conserve your oxygen, but you really do calm down quite a bit. Absolutely. And especially if you do, it's they've said it for years, and it's into your nose and out through your mouth. Mm -hmm. And what it actually does is it triggers an autonomic response that actually lowers your heart rate. And then it lowers your heart rate, then your adrenaline drops, your oxygen consumption drops, and everything else starts to slow back down. And that's really what it is about, I think, is slowing it down, making sure that you don't rush anything. And after you can do that, I think that you really will find that you make less and less mistakes. I want to ask you about the PACE plan because that's something you had on your website. You actually had a whole blog dedicated to it. What is the PACE plan? So the PACE plan is a uh, military acronym for primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency. And it can be applied to anything. But in the case of my website, it's, excuse me, it has to do with where you can find us <coughs> Because, as I'm sure everybody's aware, censorship and sites dropping and people getting kicked off platforms is all getting super rampant everywhere. And in some cases, you can't even really figure out even a justification for it. But so, like for me, primary right now is Instagram and my website. And then my alternates are, it's a thing called Element. And it's kind of like Telegram, just on the more secure side, but then it's also a little less used. And then contingency is your backup to your backup. And then emergency is when all else is failing, what do you do that you know is gonna work? Mm. So like in a lot of, so like with comms, a unit will have a primary channel. If that fails, they'll have a backup channel and it's usually on a different, uh, a different band. Then the contingency is a very simple one where there's no encryption, um, nothing fancy, just direct point to point, because it's the simplest way, because keep it simple. And then emergency is usually something completely unrelated to those platforms, because if those aren't working, you want something that's a completely different platform to try, because that might get through, and whether that's hand signals or a sat phone or anything like, or any other form of communication. But and then again, it can apply to just about anything else. So say weapon systems, you're going to want primary and a backup. And then if that both of those fail or run dry, you need something else to go to because you don't want to just stand there. And basically you want to fight till you can't anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so important is having that mindset too. Speaking about mindset, um, surveillance detection is something I think is very important but I'd love to get your take on it, man. Um, how do we develop a mindset that is able to detect or pick up on if we are being surveilled crudely or otherwise overseas? The biggest first step is to put your phone away. Because I'm sure we've all seen the videos of the people walking down the street and that walk right into fountains or telephone poles or anything else. And so when you're staring at this little four by six inch space in front of you, you're completely oblivious to the world around you. So that's step one. Step, and so once you've done that, the world seems much bigger. And then you need to know what the baseline is, what's normal. So for most Americans, cars driving, people walking around, people staring at their cell phones, if you're in a business sector, people are probably in suits or maybe polo shirts. You might see a delivery person here or there. And then learning what stands out from that. Hmm. So there's a few, it's, it's been used in movies all the time, usually gangster movies. The delivery guy will walk up and set a box down and then leave. 
and someone will look over and see that his shoes don't match. Mm. And then the bomb goes off. That's the guy realizing the baseline's off because the shoes doesn't match the guy. And so the biggest thing about mindset for it is just, or developing that mindset is to just start looking, putting the phone away and paying attention to your surroundings. Who's behind me? What cars are behind me? Who's in front of me? And then you drive for a little, if you're driving, you drive down the road for a little bit. You take a couple turns, you check again, is that car still there? Are there new cars? What are the new cars? And it's just this constant game of uh, memorization, basically. And just paying attention or paying attention. And if you see someone multiple times, start looking at them more closely. Do they fit the surroundings? Like, do they fit the surroundings? Do their clothes fit? Do their shoes match their clothes? How's their body language? Are they looking aggressive or antsy? Just all these little things. And so, just starting to pay attention, and it'll slowly, gradually, get more and more second nature just to recap here put that phone down know the baseline of where you are is somebody acting a little suspicious are they acting sketchy are they looking at you too much uh pay attention to who sticks with you on turns and uh just keep a weary eye out i think those are all outstanding um tips for us and i know that certainly those are well said I'll just leave it at that. Um, now, this leads us into disguises. I know this is something, again, on your blog that you talk about. And you go in-depth about disguises. And this is something that deeply fascinates me, being kind of a spy nerd. So what could you tell us about s- disguises and how do we go ahead and start learning about running disguises should we ever need to? So disguises range from are on a huge scale. So it can go from a ball cap and glasses all the way up to like full on synthetic faces. And that upper end of the scale is pretty much pointless for the average person and average traveler. So we're just gonna skip over all of that. What is really applicable to most people traveling and just in everyday life is the, it goes by the gray man a lot, but a lot of what's out there is the gray man info is not very, applicable or accurate but so again it's figuring out that baseline so if you're going to a business area dressing like you belong Mm. so you might put on a suit or you might put on business casual at the minimum and then if you're so start there and then having stuff you can add or subtract if you need to so like if you really want to get into it know where you're going to be so like if you're starting out in a business section and then you're going to go to a sports game afterward or go to a sports bar or something throw a jersey in your bag or if you're a woman throw a jersey in your purse and then so as you walk out of the business district you can throw on the jersey and then it completely changes your whole appearance Hmm. Hmm. And this can be applied to clothes accessories bags just about anything that is going on your person yeah, that's a really that's a really great point. You know, know where you're going to be if you can, um, and then dress to kind of match that environment. And I think that that probably would be one of the best type of disguises that you possibly could have. Um, I know when I was doing private investigation work, doing surveillance, that was always something that was on my mind. Hey, what areas of town am I going to be in? What's this person do? Could I dress more casual? Should I dress more? you know, dress it up. Um, Sometimes you don't have the luxury, I think, of knowing uh, where you're going to be exactly. But if you can kind of dress, like you said, that gray man doctrine isn't always very accurate. You know, anyone can put it out online, right? But if you could kind of dress a little bit more neutral, and this leads me into the next thing that I was seeing on your website that I thought was just so right on, um, the colors. Knowing about what kind of colors should I wear and when should I wear them is, is so key. So can you kind of go into it a little bit more with us about these ambiguous colors that you talk about? So colors, it starts with, again, the baseline. So just about anywhere you go, there's going to be tones that people tend to like. 
if you're going to a more outdoorsy area, you're going to see a lot of browns, camo, if there's a lot of hunters around, stuff like that. So that goes back to doing your research. And one of the best ways you can figure that out is Google Street View. If that's available in the place that you're going to be traveling to, absolutely check different points in the city, especially if you're going to, especially around places you're going to be hmm. and kind of see what the crowd looks like. And you'll, gen especially if it's a crowded area, you'll be able to pick up a general color scheme. So like most people that have gone through an airport, it's almost always black. People's bags are almost always black, black pants or black shirts, jeans, all those colors are going to blend in. Mm. And so that's where you start. And then you can add in the ambiguous colors part. So if someone's following you, they're probably unless they have a tracker on you which is a whole different story mm -hmm. but if they're traveling or if they're uh, following you by sight they're almost always going to be going off what you're wearing and so if they have to hand you off to somebody they might say you're wearing tan pants and a green shirt so if you can wear colors that are ambiguous so like a good example from like the military side is foliage everyone argues whether it's a gray or a green and so if you're wearing something like that they say to their partner it's the guy in the green shirt but it's foliage and the guy is saying thinks that it's green or thinks that it's gray he might miss you and follow someone who's wearing what he thinks is a green shirt mm -hmm. and so another example of this is the business sector because there's all kinds of blacks and grays and blues and they're all and especially between gray and blue there's a lot of middle ground there that gets misrepresented one way or the other or misidentified one way or the other hmm. so if you can play around in those color schemes it it's no it's definitely not a guarantee but it's just another layer of confusion you might be able to add on to anybody following you wow i really like that you know i've never actually I've never heard anybody say that, but it makes complete sense. And um, I'm going to write that one down and I'm going to keep that one for my personal notes there. I, I appreciate that one. So airports, you mentioned about the airport. Uh, you also mentioned about these uh, self-proclaimed gray men out there. And we all see them in the airports. They've got their, you know, black or gray tactical bag and their 5'11 khakis on and their, you know, Oakley ball cap or whatever it is, right? And they think they're being very um, nonchalant, but you could spot those guys like that. Now, is that, <laughs> is that playing it down? Is that being gray man? Or what would an actual gray man, um, how would somebody like that actually dress? Dress to the baseline. So airports is all jeans and you'll see t-shirts, blazers, so basically the opposite of anything tactical. Yeah. So the biggest thing just about anywhere nowadays, even overseas in a lot of places, is jeans. You wear jeans, you blend in. Especially in the countries that still like Americana, jeans yeah. are huge. And they will all be wearing them. But is there a specific cut of jean that we should get? I mean, I know in Europe they tend to wear things a little bit tighter, whereas over here we're a little more on the baggy side. I know in Germany, for example, their shorts tend to come just above the knee, whereas over here, they tend to kind of just go below the knee. And I, I, I realize this is all kind of advanced research that we do, like you were saying, before we depart. But is there something that we can kind of use as a rough guideline for when we're going overseas as far as what type of jeans we get or what type of t-shirt we're wearing? So I like to stick with conservative. Okay. So... And I don't like big labels. So I tend to, I try to wear shirts that have no labels on them, no big insignias. Just, just forgetting the argument of the walking billboard, they offer targets for people. Hmm. And it's a very identifiable thing. So like a big Nike swoosh on the back of your shirt is something they can easily lock onto in a crowd. Hmm. So that's one. But as far as, so like you talked about jeans and cuts of jeans. I definitely try to stick a little bit tighter, but still loose enough that I can move if I need to. Mm -hmm. But definitely not the hanging off your ass baggy pants that most of Americans 
tend to wear nowadays. Yeah. So and the biggest thing you can do with just about anything you dress, and even in some of the under or less developed countries, is dress up. Hmm. And you don't have to be, and I'm not talking like suits and ball gowns, but even in the less developed countries, a lot of them take way more pride in their appearance than we tend to do in America now. Hmm. So like, if you look around nowadays, you see gym shorts, yoga pants, just about everyone's wearing workout clothes. Yeah. And since the pandemic, it's only gotten worse. <laughs> <laughs> and when you go overseas, you see everyone, like no one wears, very few people, I'll just say, wears tennis shoes in Europe unless they're going to or from the gym or they're actively working out. Mm -hmm. They actually wear proper dress shoes. They're wearing slacks, even and if they're wearing shirts, it's usually at least a polo or something button up or button down. And that real casual wear is really reserved for very casual occur or, uh, occasions. Hmm. Yeah, good point. So just dressing up a notch or two from what you normally would, just that alone can work wonders. So then I assume that my American flag t-shirt with the crossed AR-15s is a no. Probably not. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily recommend wearing a lot of that anywhere nowadays, let alone traveling. Well, that's true. And that brings me into one of my final points here is that I think that people hear travel safety and they think, you know, I don't, I don't travel enough to warrant me investing my time in that. Or oh, I got it either way. But, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that you're talking about here, man, is really applicable here stateside as well as overseas, how to blend in, how to basically run a very basic disguise and get the hell away from somebody if they're after you, how to detect surveillance upon you, perhaps. Man, that stuff seems like all shit we should be studying right now just for living in the United States. Absolutely. I mean, so disclaimer, I haven't been able to or I haven't fully checked this out yet, but I was reading on some recent homicide stats. And according to this article, Oregon is up 800% over last year. So the idea that we're 100% safe at home while never really being true is exceptionally true now. <laughs> I think a lot of people, there's a good picture online. One's at the top of it's a picture of a war zone or American suburb. And it says, this is what we, or this is our bubble. And the bottom one's a war zone. It says, this is what the real world's like. And then it circles back and it says, we've forgotten that. Hmm. And I think the real world is coming back to America in a lot of ways. And people are starting to wake up to that. Yeah, I think you're right, man. I think you're right. And, you know, America's never been the safest country in the world. I remember being over in different countries in the Middle East, whether that's Israel or the UAE, places like that, you know, more civilized parts of the Middle East. And I always felt way safer than I did walking down the streets of Manhattan. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the, that's true anywhere. There's going to be pockets of safe areas in just about every country, and there's going to be complete war zones in others. So I mean, ever, this, we were talking about Southeast Asia before, uh, the Philippines. About half that country is like Afghanistan right now, and then the other half is perfectly civilized. Yeah, you know, you, I, I wouldn't necessarily think of the Philippines like that. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of stuff that we hear in the news about the Philippines, but when I think about it, I think about white sandy beaches and sipping uh, coconut water out of a coconut or something. I don't think of that. And I think that, to your point, there's a lot of countries where you might not think that you need to be prepared like this, but you do a little bit of advanced research and you'll quickly find out, hey, I need to get in touch with Dave and learn some travel trade craft, or I need to go, you know, go to fightingsecrets.com and get some relevant information and really start digging into this stuff, especially now that COVID has hit, economic strife is rampant throughout the world. People are going to be desperate for money and doing stupid things. Also, there's frankly, wars happening everywhere so with that being said man how can guys get in touch with you so right now it the two big ones like i said before uh instagram and it's at travelers tradecraft so it's traveler s tradecraft 
and then my website is the same it's travelers tradecraft.com and then i post i try to get a good article on there at least at least once a week and i try to do two and then once you're on the website you can find a link to my element room and if you click on it it'll take you step by step through how to get whatever app you need on whatever platform you're on in order to get access to that room and then inside that room i usually put more exclusive content than what's going in the public blog yeah. and then same goes for the newsletter if you sign up for the newsletter you'll get everything that's in the public blog and then you'll get a little bit more great i just signed up for the newsletter before we went live man so i'm looking forward to getting some good information you know i've been doing this stuff for a long time but frankly speaking you're the one of the few accounts that i follow that is always on point and um I, I was convinced you were some kind of CIA operative or something like that. And, you know, I may or may, may not be right, probably not. But at the same point, um, I want to just say really sincerely, like, thank you for everything that you put out there. It's it's all free, which is amazing because most guys are charging good money for this stuff. Look at Ed Cauldron. His course is run in the thousands of dollars and uh, you're giving out the same information and all you're asking is that people pay attention and stay safe out there. So that's really, that's really amazing. Yeah. And part of that is all the information's out there. It's just being able to find it. But, and so like speaking to Ed Calderon, the reason his courses are so expensive is there's a big difference between reading it and doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just giving the information out there, but you have to actually practice it. And the best way to practice it is to go find courses like that. Yeah. And, well, yeah. and I am working on some platforms and stuff to try to get some more hands-on one-on-one with people to get a little bit more in-depth and try to up that skill level a little bit for people who want it. But I have no set time frame on when that might actually be out though. So just everybody... If you're following me, just stay tuned and we'll hope to have it out there soon. We'll also um, put it out on our channels, guys. Um, I'll throw it on the Gutter Fighting Secrets Instagram. If it's still up there, uh, you know, in a few months, you never can tell. Like uh, like you said, bro, it's it's tough these days. Even for accounts like you, I'm sure you've gotten your, you know, your share of um, close calls there. But you never know if you're going to be around much longer. But I actually... I think I've flown under the radar for now at best or at worst. I think I might be getting shadow banned a little bit, but I haven't actually had the, uh, the honor of having anything removed yet. So we'll consider yourself we'll wait, we'll wait for that to happen and put that out there as a badge of honor when it does. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, you know, these days all the cool kids are getting banned and shadow banned. So, Oh yeah. I think the newest one is, uh, I don't know if you've heard of them. It's, uh, Oh, what was it? Toyota, Toyotas of War or something like that. Okay. They, uh, they're all they did was post pictures of Toyotas from War Zones, and Instagram just booted them. Yeah, it's it's been crazy, man. You know, I got uh, eighteen posts removed in three days, and they were claiming that they were copyright infringements, but the majority of them were just me talking. So. <laughs> Unless somebody yeah, copied me, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, it is what it is, and that's why, guys, you should definitely go and check out his uh, website, Travelers Tradecraft, with an S, and we'll throw all of those links down below here in the description. So you need to worry. You can get right from there down in the description over and just sign up for the newsletter if you need to use. And look, you talk about this all the time, man, using a one-time email or something like that. I'm sure you wouldn't mind if guys and girls use that as long as they can get that information out from you to them. Absolutely not. I uh, actually encourage it. And the uh, ones I recommend are either Blur or it's a service called Ann and Addy. That's actually my new favorite. So okay. well, it uh, has a lot or it's a little bit more in depth, especially if you get a paid plan. I actually just made a note of that. I'm going to look into that myself. So yeah, I appreciate, dude, I appreciate you coming on here. Um, I know it's been a, a freaking a real bitch getting our time schedules to match and everything. I know you're really busy and uh, you're probably always traveling yourself, but 
I thank you so much for coming on and giving us all these great tips and tactics, man. It's been a pleasure. Yep. My pleasure. All right, guys, don't forget, go ahead, follow Travelers Tradecraft on Instagram, subscribe to the newsletter. You can always find us at gutterfightingsecrets.com at gutterfightingsecrets on Instagram, and then obviously the YouTube channel as well. Uh, Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, please remember that you are your first and last line of defense, and I will catch you on the next Tactical Podcast.